Good evening and welcome to a special episode of COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. I'm David Allen, host of the webinar series, along with my co-hosts, Dale Fisher and Louisa Sun. We thank you for joining us in this unusual time and on this unusual day. The recent increase in Singapore COVID-19 cases have prompted us to bring you this episode earlier than scheduled to review the current COVID-19 situation in Singapore, to discuss our goals in managing the pandemic and to consider how we can best achieve our goals. While these issues may appear identical across countries and continents, they're not. Each country's circumstances are unique. Our knowledge of the virus is evolving, as is the virus, and the tools available for a particular country to intervene differs. Careful and swift consideration of the measures to be employed, followed by public education as to why those steps were selected, then implementation with subsequent assessment or adjustment of the measures have the greatest chance of assuring success when addressing a change in outbreak circumstances. We are relatively early in this process. The epi this episode is an opportunity to hear from outbreak and public health experts on their views as to where we are, where we're going, and how we can best get there. In keeping with the atypical nature uh, of this uh, special program this evening, uh, we'll take live questions as we normally don't uh, during the episode. Please submit yours via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll open tonight's uh, presentation uh, with Dale Fisher providing an epidemiology update of Singapore situation, followed by Louise's uh, review of the current uh, response measures. Uh, our convened panel will then answer questions submitted prior to and during this episode. Um, and uh, I'll begin the Q&A segment. Louisa will follow with additional questions. So without further ado, uh, Dale, over to you. Great. Um, yeah, it's, it is a, a, a privilege, I think, to, uh, uh, I guess, show how, how nimble the, the university can be in pulling together uh, uh, a show so quickly in, in response to sort of overwhelming uh, requests. So. So let's just go through the epidemiology just to make it clear on what David said. This is really only focusing on Singapore, this, this whole episode. So we're familiar with this uh, MOH document. We've been watching this for a long time. And throughout, you've, uh, you've heard me talk about imported cases here are really what is, uh, what is driving our numbers. Uh, but uh, what you can see is the, the community cases have taken this, this uh, little spike over the last few weeks. So, so this is really what's changed and, and why we're here now to, to take you through this. To, just to unpick that uh, a little bit, you can see that the blue ones are actually isolated before detection and the yellow ones are detected through surveillance. So through surveillance means they've, they've got symptoms and been tested or they're on the uh, regular routine testing or, or something like that. These, these are people that are picked up and they're, they're not already uh, in isolation. They're not, uh, they, they weren't suspected during that incubation period. So, so, so therefore they're um, by their nature a, a threat. So just to have a, an, an overview of the clusters, if you like, uh, I'll drill down on these a little bit in a minute, but obviously I can't do them in a lot of detail in this time. But the Changi Airport cluster is the, the largest cluster, obviously, it's 78 cases. Um, you can look down the, 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 the various clusters here. Obviously, there's clusters within these clusters, but these are sort of the, the starting points of them. And, and we've got down here the dates of the first case um, and the dates of the last exposure. That exposure may not actually be in that site. Um, for instance, uh, Tantok Sang, uh, their, where's that gone? their last case was not May 14. They've gone more than an incubation period actually in Tantok Sang, but people within that cluster have still been getting cases. Uh, you, you can't actually close off a cluster until two incubation periods. Uh, the reason for this is because of the uh, possibility of, a, of an unidentified case. So we don't close it off until we've gone those 14 days times two. So this is why we've got, got 16 cases uh, in a variety of, 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 of places. So if we just take off the bottom eight, because these are all um, like the, the bunker tanker and Pasir Panjang terminal. Um, these have got the, the NUS uh, person who returned from India. The, these have got... Uh, clear origins, where, whereas as these don't. So uh, these reflect the last three weeks. Um, I don't know if any of these will merge uh, uh, 
it's theoretically possible, for instance, that they all came from the Changi Airport cluster, and these are sort of subclusters that have been found as a result of this. So, so we don't know that until the epidemiology, all the investigations are finished, all the whole genome sequencing is finished. Uh, that's obviously a process to to work through. Uh, the problem with Changi Airport, of course, is that it's not only an airport, but it's also a mall where people can go shopping and they go for, for F and B. So, so, so that's what uh, made this. Now, now, let me drill down a little bit more into the, the Changi Airport cluster. Um, this is a, a nice uh, graphic that was sent to me today from, uh, from Straits Times. Um, and, and you can see that roughly... Uh, this is a transmission tree for, for those who don't know, and you could argue that the index case um, produced all these cases along here. I think there's about 16. Uh, this uh, first case identified was actually a 88-year-old male cleaner, and, and that started the own, its own thread. So you hear us talking about breaking of transmission chains, and here you can see how it, it, it extends down there. Um, things like this. Hopefully, um, this person uh, was diagnosed on May 10, so maybe this particular chain uh, will, will be over soon. So, um, the, the interesting thing about this is that uh, often a lot of these cases are actually airport workers, um, cleaners and, and uh, uh, security and things like this. And as we go down here, we get into more of those, those secondary cases, uh, the F and B outlets, and then people uh, transmitting it outside of that. So here you've got like the, uh, uh, a cleaner here, but then uh, they've, they've transmitted it uh, down to a uh, to massive poly, polyclinic student. So polytechnic student. Um, so, um, you can look, as you look across these, it's quite, quite uh, hard to tell, but you can see most of the people where you've got a little um, uh, black Q, uh, they, they weren't in quarantine at the time of the onset of symptoms. So this has gone uh, really uh, too quickly, if you like, and that, that's why it's, it's a threat. Um, but as I said, many of these chains uh, are at around a week, uh, and hopefully these... Um, uh, we'll be able to close down soon. Um, the other thing is this, there's been a very short um, serial uh, interval, the, the time taken between cases. If I just uh, drill, so let, let's take this first row here. Um, so this is uh, the top of the first row. This is the second uh, of the first row, the, the left-hand column. And if you look, this first tier was on May the 4th. The second tier is all between May 3 and May 7. This third tier is between May 8 and, and May 11. And then this fourth tier is between May 10 and May 12. So we've got four generations of cases that have occurred in just over a week. So, so this, I think, highlights just how, how hard it has been for, for people to catch up with the, and, and get ahead of the game, if you like. Um, it's, it's also a reason um, why um, the, some, some more blunt measures are, uh, are going to be needed because uh, we can't get ahead of it if the time between the generations is, is, is so fast. I hope that makes sense. Um, here's, uh, here's one, this, uh, this uh, where's she gone? Lost her, anyway. Um, okay, so when you start to look at all the clusters and in detail at the, the biggest cluster, uh, obviously there's a lot, of quarantine, a lot of contact tracing being done, a lot of quarantine being done. And, uh, but as, as a second layer, um, what uh, the ministry's obviously done is, is capture all the, the sites that people have visited, just, just in case there's a more casual contact uh, perhaps an unidentified contact. And they've listed uh, between May 3rd and May 15, 290 sites that, that have been visited. So again, uh, visited by people while they're infective. 
So as I mentioned, uh, every effort made to do the contact tracing, quarantine those people, um, notify people, make people aware if they're sick uh, to get tested. But this is a, a huge operation with 290 sites that, uh, that needed that effort put in as a, as a sort of a second layer of awareness. Now, you're all familiar with these uh, graphs that I show each month in, uh, for, again, from Ministry of Health Information. Um, and, and what I want to show you is, is these areas. So, so these cases, these are the ones isolated before detection. So this is if you've, uh, for instance, you're a contact, uh, you put in isolation and then a few days later you develop symptoms or your test becomes positive and you're asymptomatic or whatever, then then that's these. And you can see these have taken a jump up, but we don't care too much about these, right? These, these are already in isolation. These are very unlikely to, to transmit. These are much more worrying. These are the ones detected through surveillance. As I mentioned, they're the ones that are uh, either presenting with a symptom to their, to their family doctor or, or wherever for a swab. Um, they're the ones having uh, uh, rapid uh, routine testing. So there's 71 of these, there's 78 of these, um, that's uh, 149, I'll come back to that number in a minute. I just wanted to flick back, this is where we were a month ago, right? And you can just see that this is a wall of zero ones and twos and, in, and uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, fortnight, there were seven cases uh, in, in non-isolation instead of what we've got now is about uh, 49, I think I said. So. This was able to be managed because we were wearing masks, we didn't have uh, super spreading events, uh, but it is hard to ignore the fact that we're now de dealing with a less forgiving, more transmissible virus. So let me bring it back to that uh, 149. Uh, you remember I said that they can also be looked at um, in terms of whether they're linked or unlinked. So the other one was whether they are already isolated or not isolated, but are they linked or unlinked? So now we've got so sometimes you might be able to identify a case that is in the community and is routine testing or something, but you actually find he's linked to another case. So, so they can be in that as well. But, but these community unlinked cases actually are, are, are particularly scary because, because we don't know how they got this. Now, sometimes as in the case of this information, that number was reduced by five because we were able to link five of the people. But you can see from that first um, transmission tree, the, uh, the uh, Changi Airport one, you can see how we, we need to start putting, uh, when I say we, um, our, uh, our, our ministry colleagues need to be putting together all these cases, linking where we can uh, and trying to uh, uh, make sure there's no sort of loose threads that, uh, that might sort of be appearing in parallel that we don't know about. Okay, so I mentioned quarantine. Um, you can see again, since the, uh, say, well, over the last week, uh, the number of people uh, per day uh, being put into quarantine is, is skyrocketing as you'd expect. So this is uh, a reflection of the efforts and uh, of the contact tracing teams and those um, implementing their work. Uh, and you can see here, the number of total people in quarantine is about seven and a half thousand now. This is, uh, this is apart from travellers, of course. Now, let's go back a month. So these are the May ones. These are the April ones. You can see we're looking 200, 400, as opposed to sort of 800, 1100 over here. So it's two or three times as high. And again, the total number of people in quarantine uh, here is three and a half versus 7,000. So it's, it's double the number. So all this is happening behind the scenes to, to stop these, these chains of transmission. Uh, so what's happening uh, in Singapore at the moment? Uh, the numbers, um, not too bad. I mean, there's, there's three in ICU, which is high for us at the moment. A uh, couple of hundred uh, in the general wards and 246 in care facilities. Uh, there's been one death in, in, in the, re the recent weeks. I just wanted to, to show this by way of comparison that uh, you can look at the uh, a month ago, the number of cases in the general wards was, was in the 60s. So we've got triple the number of people in hospital uh, and about the same number in, in care facilities um, and one death, death difference. So 
I'm trying to paint a, a picture here of, of something that we've got a good idea of, but not a complete idea of. It is starting to have an impact in, uh, in, in hospital beds, but not uh, obviously overwhelming yet. Um, and that's, that's where we are. David. Great, Dale. Thank you. Very thorough and uh, insightful as always. Um, Louisa, uh, would you mind bringing us up to date regarding uh, the measures uh, being put in place to uh, address uh, what's Dale, what Dale's describing? Yes, and good sure. evening. Gladly. Good evening. And good evening, everyone who's joined us. Okay, let me just slide my slides. Okay, so this is actually a real screenshot from my phone, and I think that this is what a lot of us have been familiar with. Um, but it seems that probably everything has just been happening in a bit of a whirlwind um, in the last month. So before we enter the really juicy part of today's uh, webinar, I'm just going to take a few minutes to break down and remind us of what the major changes have been and who they have affected. So starting with our healthcare institutions and our healthcare workers, um, the first is that um, there was a hygiene screening protocol, which additionally included uh, one of our hospitals, Tan Tok Singh, the inpatient areas. But thankfully, um, that outbreak was actually very swiftly um, and effectively controlled. So this is, uh, has just been removed uh, yesterday. Um, and the next thing is that actually that affects all healthcare workers and anyone who has actually uh, been in a hospital for a significant amount of time and worked there is that uh, everyone is required now to undergo rostered routine testing. There has been a one-time sweep done for everyone and subsequently all patient-facing staff will need to continue with um, their rostered testing. So now, yes, all of us know what it feels like to have a nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal or a combination of both swabs. Yeah. So now uh, the first week was due for completion soon though. Um, and additionally, um, there's actually also been an enhanced PPE guidance that was just released from MOH. This now necessitates um, all of our uh, patient funding staff and in inpatient areas to actually wear an N95 respirator mask instead of um, just a surgical mask. Um, so this is something that I was particularly curious about and I'm hoping that we'll have some time to um, explore this later. So now moving on to our patients. So now all patients who are admitted to the hospital will get a screening COVID swab. Now this is a bit different from those who are admitted with, um, uh, who are suspect cases or who are admitted with symptoms that are, are suggestive or they need to be evaluated for COVID. So this is for all patients who are admitted for any reasons um, apart from evaluation of COVID-19. All of them on admission to the hospitals, they will get one um, COVID PCR swap, and we call this um, enhanced surveillance. So the other, um, uh, the other, uh, the other aspect that is different for patients now is that actually, so the suspect cases who present with um, any acute respiratory infection symptoms, they will actually undergo a rapid antigen test on top of the um, SARS-CoV-2 PCR. And I think this is a lot just to take away the conveyance time that happens because a patient or a PU, uh, patient who is under quarantine or is under stay-home notice who has symptoms, sometimes will come to the EDs or go to our polyclinics, they will get swabbed and perhaps be sent back first and wait for the uh, PCR results. So that turnaround time can be very much shortened and these are high risk patients. So we can successfully catch a proportion of them who are already positive and isolate them immediately while we're doing confirmatory tests. So this actually saves us a lot of time in between as well. So lastly, this is for our general public and also for the travellers who are coming in. Um, these are some of the major adjustments that have been made um, on travel entry as well as our safe management measures in the country. So for travel restrictions, a travel ban for India was actually imposed uh, on the 22nd of April. And a little more than a week later, on the 30th, um, the borders were further, further tightened uh, for entry from our countries uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, as well as uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, stricter post-quarantine uh, rules were also applied uh, to those who returned from Thailand. And a few more days later, on the 4th of May, travel screening was actually further extended to uh, 21 days prior to arrival rather than the previous 14 that we screened for. And on the 7th of May, to further control the borders, work pass holders uh, who had to obtained prior approval to come in had also had their entry dates postponed. And lastly, on 13th May, we saw further tightening uh, of quarantine rules. 
So now in the community wise, uh, we began with the closure of our outdoor barbecue pits on the 30th of April. Um, this is to prevent large gatherings as well as what this is known as a mask off activity. So people are likely to be eating uh, with their masks off uh, for a substantial period of time. So and then barely a week after this, we then entered the phase, uh, the heightened alert of uh, phase three, actually, uh, where, the, where further safe management measures were implemented that affected uh, both social activities, uh, workplace rules, as well as indoor and outdoor exercises. And then uh, subsequently, a few days later, um, the start date for the mandatory use of our Trace Together app, which is a contact tracing app, was actually announced to be moved forward. And this would help our MOH contact tracers um, to uh, swiftly identify the contacts of any positive cases. Cases. And now finally, this is the phase that we're actually in now since Monday. Um, there was a phase two heightened alert that was issued. And so most notably in this, uh, social outings, household visitors are now only restricted to two persons down from five and down from the previous eight in phase two. And our f &B outlets are actually no longer open for dine-ins. And of course, several outdoor and indoor event sizes are to be scaled down. So I think it's a time that is um, filled with anxiety and uncertainty as we all try to hunker down again. And we have many questions and uh, maybe even our own theories and about what exactly led us um, you know, to where we are today. So without further ado, I will hand, uh, ado, I will hand you over to Prof. Dale uh, and uh, Prof. David Allen, sorry, Prof. David Allen, as well as our panel of experts who will try to ex address all your questions um, and hopefully debunk some of the theories that are actually rumors in disguise at the moment. Great, Louisa, thank you so much. Um, and uh, let me remind everybody, uh, the viewers, to uh, submit your questions uh, through the Q&A uh, uh, button at the bottom. And uh, you can uh, designate who you'd like to answer it amongst the panelists. Uh, and we'd uh, very much appreciate that. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, it, uh, our eminent uh, panel tonight includes uh, Prof. Yy Kyo, who's a dean of the Sawsui Hak School of Public Health at the National University of Singapore, and he's founding director of the School Center for Health Services and Policy Research. Also is Associate Professor uh, Su Liang, who is Infectious Disease Physician, Vice Dean of Global Health and Program Re Leader of Infectious Disease at uh, the Sawsui Hak uh, School of Public Health as well as uh, uh, Professor Dale Fisher, Senior Consultant, uh, Division of Infectious Disease, National University Hospital, Chair of National Infection Prevention and Control Committee, at Ministry of Health, and the Chair of the Global uh, Outreach Alert and Response uh, uh, Network hosted by WHO. Gentlemen, uh, thank you for taking time from your busy schedules to join us tonight. I know there's a lot going on and you're in great demand. Uh, let me begin the segment by asking each of you uh, in, uh, in order, uh, what's your assessment of the current uh, uh, COVID uh, situation in Singapore as presented by uh, Dale and Louisa. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll take it from there. Liang, would you lead us off? Thank you, David. And it's good to see you again. I think our uh, assessments are unavoidably colored by the interventions that are rolled out by the government in quick succession, as well as the messages in the media, including the views of experts like um, yourself and Dale. Um, objectively, I think we are worse off compared to January this year, but still we are definitely better off compared to April and May last year, even taking into account the fact that we are dealing with a much more transmissible variant of concern. Over to you. Can I ask you quickly, you, how do we know it's more transmissible? I think there's a lot of evidence coming out of um, UK, um, as well as in other parts of the world, definitely in India, where he has replaced all the other variants, um, including UK and South, Af South African variants. Dale, what's your assessment? Um, I just realised I forgot to give kudos to all the, uh, the people who provided the data that, uh, that I just gave. You've got to remember, if, for, for all the surging that we're all doing clinically and, and in media or whatever, then... Uh, then the, the same things are happening there. But what, what I'm seeing is, a, is um, incredible efforts to really create a, uh, as well a nuanced response as possible. Um, uh, certainly many other countries would have just shut down by now. Um, but what Singapore is doing is trying to maximise the, the, the capacities of the, of the public health response and build in social restrictions that I ideally have got the least social and economic impact uh, at this stage. So, so that's the aim. We, we need to be looking at the, 
the cases, and not just the the cases, but the the hospitalizations, the ICUs, the deaths. They they they're what matter because because cases don't quite mean what they meant uh, pre-vaccination. We've got 32% of people have had the first jab and they're not going to get severe disease. So, so it is a slightly different consideration. Hmm. Great. Why, why? Well, thanks, David. And it's a pleasure to be on, on this. So my assessment is that it's quite worrying. And I think it comes back to what Dale shared earlier on in terms of the speed and the diversity of the spread this time round. Because what we are seeing this time round is that we are able to generate four generations of outbreaks from a, a, a single case within a period of less than 10 days. And that speed, it's frightening. And clearly, because it stems from a very public place, such as the airport, it is now penetrating into different parts of the community. And I think that is why I assess this to be very worrying. The response is what Dale has mentioned, actually, has been calibrated at really targeting the areas that are deemed to be high risk, including activities that are high risk. And, and we have seen that this ban on dining in, at least for the next four weeks, it's really to minimize situation where people will be mingling in public spaces with their mask off. And from the very beginning, we know that some of these activities are extremely risky. And I think that's where our response have been targeting. Over back to you, David. I think the interesting thing to me is the uniformity in, in realization of how serious this situation is and the acceptance of uh, the people, the, the population and the professionals uh, of recognizing how serious it is and, and doing their, uh, their deeds to, to protect themselves and protect others. So it's, it's a fascinating uh, um, eye-opening experience. Okay, well, thank you. Um, let's move to the next question. What in your opinion, uh, and this is your opinion, uh, should be Singapore's goals for managing COVID-19? Zero tolerance or adapting to a SARS-CoV-2 as an endemic pathogen, something that we're going to adapt to and live with. Uh, Dale, lead us off. So, yeah, this builds on from the first question. We, I believe by now we would have a circuit breaker in place uh, if there was no vaccine. Now, because it's just hard to see how we can get on top of this. But knowing that, that we've got a, a you know, moderately high vaccination rate at 32% first jab now, that is a game changer. Uh, if, if we think of the end point, the, the end point of this pandemic is going to be endemic disease circulating fairly freely, uh, although probably with some modifications in protecting vulnerable sites such as hospitals and nursing homes. But, um, but we're going to need high levels of, of vaccination, which will reduce COVID to a fairly mild disease, which can circulate around. Now, at what point do we, do we say we're okay for the circulation? Obviously, at 30%, um, we're not there yet. Um, but, but there does come a point where, where we need to um, traverse, and, and we're traversing now. So, so I, think, um, I, I think the goal is to live with the virus. Don't, um, don't lock down because lockdowns are not going to be a, a, a long-term solution. And one day it'll, we'll just be living with it. So let's uh, try and control it while we, while we get people vaccinated. Not that this is part of the uh, issue tonight, but what do you think about countries who are still striving for zero tolerance? Uh, I think they've got a, a, a lot of work to do with their communities to, to help them understand that they're heading for an endemic disease. Uh, and they have to transition there and, and eventually accept cases and clusters. Why, why, how do you think we're going to uh, get the population to accept the possibility of, or the probability of uh, this being an endemic pathogen? Are we close, are we far? Well, I'll, I'll touch on that in a bit, David, but I, I would like to touch on this point that you mentioned, the zero tolerance strategy, because I think when countries rely on a zero tolerance strategy, ultimately they are relying on extremely strict border control measures to the point that they are blocking almost all travelers into the country. And, and by doing that, there is this artificial sense of stability and safety that is essentially created by this bubble of, 
of no travellers coming in. But that zero tolerance, or, or rather that complete closures of the borders, cannot last long for most countries. And there is also a secondary impact, which WHO have highlighted from the very beginning, that you could close your borders, but it cannot be the only response that is put in place, that you have to put in place other public health measures, of which vaccination is one very crucial measure, but you have to put in place all these other measures as well, because the reality is that the moment you gently relax some of your border control measures, you are going to see importations into a community, a population which is not very well mentally prepared to deal with an outbreak. And I think that actually is going to be very harmful in the long term. And Singapore, unfortunately, will not have the wealth of resources and manpower, such as China, Australia, and New Zealand, to actually adopt a zero tolerance strategy. So I think coming to this bit about endemic pathogen, how do we live with it? I think it is really trying to balance how do we allow um, the vast majority of our economic activities, our social activities to resume while managing importation risk as best as we can based on the latest information that we have. And I think the bit about what David, uh, what Dale mentioned on vaccination, I think it's important to highlight that vaccination continues to look like a very sensible public health measure that has been proven safe with extremely, extremely low rates of serious adverse events four in 100,000 doses. That is very low adverse events that we're looking at. And also it's effective because if we look at some of the, the people who have been infected right now, despite the fact that they've been vaccinated, the vast, vast majority of them have either no symptoms or extremely mild symptoms. That is what the, the vaccination was designed to do in the first place. What do you say to those who complain and say, wait, I got vaccinated, I shouldn't be infected at all. How dare you? Well, we have to look at really what was the vaccination designed to do? The vaccination was designed to minimize serious symptoms, serious disease from the infection. It was not meant to block completely the risk of infection. Now, if we can be infected after vaccination, but we, we are asymptomatic, we do not actually have any risk of going to the hospitals to suffer from a serious, serious consequence, actually that looked like one of the few ways of living with the disease in the long term. Liang, do, uh, do me a favor, uh, be a contrarian. Tell me your, your, your game aiming for zero tolerance. <laughs> I'm sorry, David. I have to agree with uh, Dale and YY. Um, and I think we'll have to learn to live with um, this COVID-19 virus. If you look at the, the history of human diseases, uh, measles was probably worse in the past and so was tuberculosis and we have developed vaccines for, for some of them, and we have learned to live with them. I think at some points, we will accept that this is going to be around for the longest time. Um, we will vaccinate as many people as we can, and we will see whether that's an acceptable price to, to pay for, for is, living with it. Is that, a, and I apologize for interrupting, but is that a discussion we have to have, is that there is going to be a price? There is going to be... Um, an economic price. Uh, uh, there's going to be a, a cost of a finite loss of life uh, price of living with the, the virus. Yes, I think this has been the threat undergoing all the different announcements um, and the interventions coming in. Why, why? We're going to start off with you about this next question. Uh, how do you view Singapore's current uh, COVID-19 strategies? Do you, uh, do you anticipate certain interventions to be more successful than others? Are there modifi modifications you would make? Again, I know you're not setting policy. You're just uh, a expert uh, po uh, pontificating. <laughs> so from the very beginning, I think we have all acknowledged that the risk of COVID-19 is going to come from the borders. When travelers come into the country, they bring with them uh, the infection that is going to spill over to the community. So Singapore has always adopted a risk-based approach when it comes to border controls, where we have quarantine, we have different levels of repeated testing to ensure that our measures at for border controls actually mop up almost all the infected travellers. There will be the occasional spillovers into the, the community, and we, we accept that. We, we know about that. And, and increasingly, this is 
looking like because incubation periods may be longer than the quarantine period of 14 days initially. Now we have, of course, 21 days quarantine. Or we could also have spillovers from frontline workers at the airport or at hotels, some of these quarantine facilities, they themselves being infected. And this is why all along, from ever since Singapore's situation improved, they'll talk about months of zeros and ones. Personal and community measures were never entirely lifted. And I do worry when I see jurisdiction now talking about not going with masks and increasing the amount of social activities that's permitted. But I think despite the fact that we have long stretches of zero community cases, we never really lift measures that are meant to protect individuals and protect the community. Because we know that as, as long as there are people moving in and out of Singapore, which we have to, we accept that there will be some spillovers. And that's where contact tracing, isolation, testing protocols that have worked very well for the past one year continues to work. And right now, what Dale has highlighted in his initial introduction suggests that we need to change our strategy around contact tracing, around border controls, because the game has changed. The, the, the coronavirus that we're now dealing with different variants that are much more transmissible. So ultimately, Singapore's strategy is still going to be centered on vaccination, but not solely on vaccination, relying on multiple layers of different public health measures, including the personal measures, including some loss in our individual freedom, our, our restrictions at work and in social activities. But on the whole, there are multiple layers that will work together to protect individuals and the community. Leon, um... There are there interventions you think are going to be more successful? Would you want to make some changes? I think it's easy to, to second guess um, strategies and interventions, but it's actually impossible to go back in time to, to redo them over again. And also when we talk about um, the success of strategies, we often mean the direct effects of reducing transmission, but we are quite bad at evaluating their indirect effects. Having said all that, I think um, if you look at closing schools, for instance, it's more precautionary than effective. Um, you'll touch on RRT by healthcare workers. Again, I think this is going to come down quite low on the cost effectiveness scale, but they are done for different reasons other than cost effectiveness. Dale? I, I think um, we, we can see where we are now, and, and I and I believe we can see where we need to be in, in the future in, in a year or, or two or three, and it'll vary by country. The, the tricky bit is how to traverse there. I, I don't think many people would say do less now. You, you can certainly argue about this or that intervention, but uh, I think most people would agree from, from the current epi that we need to be fairly aggressive. What I'm pleased about, though, is that we're not doing a lockdown because, to me, that is 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 like saying, um, you know, we, we can't do it. Uh, virus wins. Um, as I say, if 30% of the population was more vulnerable, uh, I might be a bit more nervous. And and indeed, if the hospitals start to fill up, um, be, because we're really seeing, you know, there's a threat of being overwhelmed. Then again, you'd have to you'd have to look at a lockdown. But at, at the moment, the strategy of 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 nuancing uh, various interventions in different settings, uh, I think, is smart. Leon, first question for you here: uh, Are there variant viral characteristics uh, which uh, prompted these clusters to occur now, or were they inevitable? Were we this was this wasn't a matter of if; it's a matter of when. Thanks, David. I think, I think this was already addressed in part by a few other panelists, including Dale in his original presentation. So the variants of concern are all more transmissible compared to the original virus from Wuhan, which I think, by the way, is virtually extinct. <laughs> yes. so, so the UK scientists, for instance, have estimated this Indian variant that's spreading around, this B1617, as being 70% more transmissible than even their own UK B117 variant. And I've always thought that um, the way that we're doing things, as uh, Professor Thieu has uh, mentioned, um, that new cases and clusters would be unavoidable in the long run. But with more transmissible variants, this has um, just speeded up the process. Mm. I think you can still find the Wuhan virus in some laboratories, but that's about it. Um, I talk about uh, laboratories. Pardon? Don't talk about Wuhan labs. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Sensitive topic. 
Okay, uh, uh, YY, uh, what events would prompt you to recommend we revert to a circuit breaker level of restrictions? Increasing number of unlinked cases, modeling predictions, uh, based on uh, 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 the duration of time with continued sporadic unlinked cases, increasing use of hospital beds. What would trigger you to say enough virus wins, as Dale said? I think Dale has actually given a very, very useful guideline that when we use a circuit breaker, we are effectively saying that we need to tap on the brakes quite significantly to allow us to understand what's exactly happening in the community. Secondly, to break chains of transmission quite aggressively. And thirdly, to allow our healthcare facilities to breathe, to recuperate, to recover, and, and to minimize, to, to start reducing their load. So clearly an indicator will really be a very rapidly increasing number of unlinked cases in the community, which we are starting to see because this transmission events happening in the community that we do not have any prior insights, those are the unlinked cases. Those are the worrying ones. The second will actually be the growing size of existing open clusters as well. And you could already see that uh, in Dale's introduction, he talked about the Changi Airport cluster and the size of it is staggering. It's 74 people now. So if we start to see clusters expanding to other segments of the population, including schools, especially people in different sectors, it actually means that the spread is happening very quickly within the community that our present protocols that have, I, I highlight once again, our present protocols on contact tracing, on isolation and testing have worked well for the past one year. But right now, because dealing with much more transmissible variant that could be two to three times more transmissible than the version that we saw in January of 2020, we start to realize that we need to change our strategies and, and, over, and overhaul our strategies. The third indicator is really what I talk about and what Dale mentioned, the availability of our healthcare resources. The moment we start to see our hospitals filling up, getting overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients, that is an indication we really need to tap on the brakes to put in place a circuit breaker to allow our hospitals to recover. Excellent, thanks. Uh, Dale. What role do you believe mask use and or social distancing, appropriate or otherwise, has played in uh, Singapore's current uh, situation? If uh, routine surgical masks are effective, why do uh, front-facing healthcare workers need N95s? Yeah, so this uh, airborne versus droplet uh, argument has been alive and well for, for a long time now. The, the general position is that we accept airborne can happen. Now, we, we know aerosol generating procedures in hospitals uh, can do it. We, we believe some uh, possible e events, uh, maybe karaoke indoor in a poorly ventilated area, maybe that can generate aerosols. But um, the, we, we still strongly believe, most of us, that the, the vast majority of cases are droplet spread. Um, uh, conventional surgical masks have served us uh, very well. Um, but, uh, but as you know, uh, MOH has, has recently introduced uh, N95 masks uh, in hospitals. Um, now, why, why are they doing that? Um, it, I could say it certainly wasn't uh, without a fair bit of discussion. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, this is a high stakes game. Ho hospitals are, are, are very vulnerable. Um, they have vulnerable patients inside them, patients not wearing any masks, um, a, a lot of uh, inability to, to socially distance. So, so I think if you can do anything to protect your hospitals, that is, is critical. And e even if it stops, say, one, one or two um, you know, freak aerosol events, then that could prevent a, a whole hospital cluster and the ramifications that come with that. So, so I, I get why they've done it. Um, I, I think it's it's risk aversion uh, in a very vulnerable setting, and and I don't have a big problem with with risk aversion driving policy sometimes. Um, and uh, and also this is for a time period. This is a time period while we. We learn a bit more about this B one six one seven. It's uh, it, it's maybe we will learn. I, I would say 
it, it would be very unusual for a, any organism to change its its mode of transmission. So so it would be more about the fact that if 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 aerosol was slightly possible before to cause infection, then because it's more infective, then it's slightly more possible now. So so I, I think that's the perspective I would give it all. Ventilation, sure, that's going to be looked at in future future buildings, future healthcare settings, I'm sure. Uh, even existing ones, people are looking now. Can we, can we open more windows or something? So, so there is a good emph emphasis on, on uh, ventilation as well. I hope that covers a lot of the questions. I know the CDC, US CDC, tried to get out of this, uh, this issue of discussing droplets and airborne and just chat uh, as if, as the fluid dynamics people saying it's a continuum. There's we shouldn't be using droplets and airborne. It's conceptually not right. Uh, Dale, does, does the vaccination status of the person wearing the mask, does that matter which mask you're comfortable with? Would you be more comfortable with, uh, would you be comfortable with uh, uh, just a surgical mask if you've been vaccinated and an N95 if you hadn't? Again, we're not talking, we're talking risk aversion. Yeah, um, a, a, as a policy, I don't think you can implement something like that. I think you've got to have, uh, have, have a broad thing. Um, we know that uh, people that are have vaccinated that are infected can still transmit. Um, we believe it's they're less likely to transmit, but uh, yeah, it's all it's not it's not uh, it's it's not binary. Uh, I think that have a lower risk, but I wouldn't introduce that into a policy. Liang, uh, what are views on the role of uh, rostered regular testing of asymptomatic uh, congregate dwellers, whether dormitory residents or healthcare workers or MRT personnel, uh, generally people who are exposed to the public versus just outbreak-related screening? You're asking me a very hot and controversial question, David. No, no, no. We're, we're, not, we're not keeping score. We're just uh, we're here having a nice time, having a nice discussion. All right. Well, I think um, rostered routine testing, or RRT, is part and parcel of the overall COVID-19 strategy. If you're thinking or if you're aiming at a suppression strategy that looks actually very much like an elimination strategy in many parts of the world, right? Personally, I do not see RRT as a viable long-term strategy for most groups of workers because of its tremendous costs, uh, inconvenience, and low yield, um, but particularly in sectors where most of the workers have either been vaccinated or infected as a way of preventing transmission to more vulnerable members of the community and providing reassurance uh, to the community that possible measures are in place. I think it sends uh, a good message. Um, as I said, long term, um, probably we will not be able to sustain it, but we'll have to bear with it for the time being. Would you have an in-between position where you say instead of uh, doing the uh, PCR, the nasopharyngeal or the mid-terminate uh, oral pharynx that you would use a, uh, an antigen detection uh, collected by a different uh, modality with a lesser sensitivity? Or is that just either do it or you don't? I think there are many ways to do RRT. Um, yep. And the sensitivity depends on both the test as well as the, the frequency of testing. Right? So I'm not in against any form of uh, testing in that sense. Gotcha. I won't, I won't press you further. All right. I, I, Why, what? I wouldn't mind seeing RRT a bit more nuanced as well. I don't think uh, uh, if you have it for one particular sector, it necessarily has to be across the board if that particular sector is a, is a different risk or has been repeatedly negative, for instance. But are, are healthcare workers, just to play devil's advocate, are they not uh, uh, interfacing with a very vulnerable population? Generally, they're older, less likely to have a response to the vaccine much more likely to have morbidity if they became infected? Uh, yeah, but they're, they're also vaccinated. So you, there, there's, there's pros and cons to, to all of this, but really the, uh, until recently, there'd been ho no hospital clusters. Um, there's, there's proficient um, PPE wearing. Um, so, so I think where there's no suspicion, you've done a sweep. Um, I think there's an argument for, for not it's it's extremely disruptive to health services actually to 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 have to swab all your staff. Um, you, you discover false positives. Um, I'm just saying there's a there's there's a downside to doing this uh, repeatedly, as as yep. Liang says, it's 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 difficult to sustain.
Why, why? Uh, there's some data coming out that suggests that uh, giving the uh, mRNA vaccine, uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, uh, uh, up to eight weeks out uh, is actually associated with a greater uh, immune response uh, in the elderly uh, compared to uh, giving it uh, three weeks apart. Uh, if we were to revert to or convert to a less frequent uh, schedule, would that mean we should uh, uh, give us an opportunity to roll out the vaccine to a greater uh, percentage of people ASAP? Yes, definitely, David, because I think this is very much in line with the responses to COVID-19 throughout the whole pandemic, that as new evidence and new data emerges from a very, very new pathogen and the way to ward against this pathogen, countries have to start thinking about uh, tweaking their public health measures. And I think in this particular case, it's very recent that the science shows that actually a single dose already confers between 70 to 90% protection, especially about 10 days after receiving the dose. But if you delay the second dose by uh, about uh, 10 to 12 weeks, you could actually boost the immune response of people by up to more than threefold. And I think that those are very new findings that was just published last week. So from a personal protection perspective, delaying the dose now actually seems like a very good idea that, that it increases the level of protection for each individual. But David, you ask about the, the protection to the population because now if we are able to stagger out the, the delivery of the second dose, it means that what could have been delivered as the second dose to a group of people within three weeks can now be extended to many more people at the population level to give them their first dose. And there's already also been, been evidence published showing the public health benefit of delaying the second dose by giving the second dose to more people who will be vaccinated as their first dose. So that actually increases the overall protection of the people within the population. And I highlight this bit that the first dose alone can already confer between 70 to 90% protection. And the, the second dose just adds on top of it and gives it a longer longevity of the protection. Humans being what they are, aren't you afraid that if you spread it out to 12 weeks, they'll say, never mind? If I can remember three weeks, 12 weeks, uh, I'm okay. Uh, never mind. So I think in, in many jurisdictions, including Singapore, this is where the health services, the way that we roll out the vaccination matters, because that is the way that we remind people, whether it is through SMS messages, or we have this white little card that reminds you when you're, next, you're due for your next dose, those actually help active, to remind people actively to come forward for their vaccination, for their second dose. And in fact, a webinar like this also reiterates the importance of vaccination. So I think we have enough media, social media, traditional media advocating the need to keep up with the vaccination that I don't think that people in Singapore at least will, will see that hesitancy to take up the second dose. Yep, very well said. Uh, Dale, you and I deal with a lot of vulnerable people in the hospital. Um, do we not owe it to them to be vaccinated? Should vaccination be for healthcare workers be mandatory uh, or versus uh, voluntary but strongly encouraged? So the bottom line is we want people vaccinated. Uh, and there's two ways to do that, I think, is, is coercion uh, with uh, education, appealing to their, their sense of, uh, of science or, or community or whatever. Uh, and the alternative is um, is actually just to mandate it. Um, uh, I think uh, a, as a human science, uh, you're much better off. Uh, you, you'll get along with with any adult better if if they've made the decision themselves than if you've told them what to do. And 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 I can tell you there is so much buy-in required for this outbreak uh, response. That's this prolonged outbreak break response. Um, vaccine is only part of the buy-in, so so I, I I would much rather see what we're doing now, which is, which is working with people uh, to get to the to the end point we need to get to, um, and and at the end of the day, when people realise that that uh, we're allowing the the virus to run, then they'll realise that uh, that their risk of not having the vaccine is that they're the ones at risk of severe disease. Hmm. Can I just flip this around, uh, David, and, and ask maybe one way of doing it instead of making it mandatory 
is to loosen the, the criteria for vaccinating. I know there are lots of healthcare workers and, and members of the public who want to be vaccinated, but they're prevented because they had anaphylaxis to a bee sting or, or are pregnant or, or something like that, right? If we loosen the restrictions more in line with what's going on in other parts of the world, then you could get a higher vaccination uptake as well. Yeah, so there's, there's certainly, a, again, risk aversion. I'm using that term a lot today. There's certainly risk aversion in the vaccination clinics. Um, it's easier to say no than take the risk of having a big problem. And, and this is one reason we've, we've opened up uh, vaccine clinics in hospitals so it can be done in a more supervised way. So I, I, think, uh, I think what you'll find, uh, I, I believe every uh, acute hospital has such a clinic. I'm, I'm not sure on that, but I believe so. Um, and and if, if such people want a vaccine and they've been rejected, then hopefully they can go to the hospital and get one. I think there's also the issue in the world, there's a finite amount of vaccine available uh, and each country has a finite amount and is quickly trying to sort out how best to allocate it. Um, so it's, it's not as if there's a, an infinite supply. So that, that factors into how quickly we get to whom uh, and whomever. Liang, uh, vaccinated people have, with measurable neutralizing antibody can become infected, we know that. They, they have mild infection, but can they be a vector? Can they infect others? This question, I don't think has been answered completely, but I think the answer is definitely yes. I say this because I think UK investigators recently published this study where they looked at um, infection rates in the households of uh, healthcare workers who have been vaccinated and those who haven't been vaccinated. And they found that while the infection rates in households of those that have been vaccinated did drop. Um, it did not drop significantly enough to rule out the possibility that those who are vaccinated can transmit uh, the virus to them. And I think as infectious disease doctors, um, basically we accept that anyone who can be infected can potentially transmit the, the virus. The, the key point is that um, vaccination does reduce transmission of the virus as well. So it's not zero, but it is um, uh, much better than someone who hasn't been vaccinated. Thank you. Well, well stated. Very well stated. Why, why you get the question uh, that everybody wants answered, and that's, uh, uh, in your opinion, is home-based learning a key component to achieving our pandemic goals? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks very much, David. But, but maybe before I touch on that question, I could touch on something that has just been announced in Singapore, which is the vaccination with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to children between the age of 12 and 16. And I think Excellent. it's important to highlight that, again, we have seen new evidence in terms of the safety factor of this vaccine for young children. I, I do see it in some of the questions that are coming through. Is the vaccine gen genuinely safe for children? To take and I think as a parent myself that is a question that I'm, I'm I would be deeply concerned with and I think it's important to highlight that Pfizer's study about 2,200 children in and and actually look at the effectiveness of the vaccine in this group of children and of the 1,000 over children who received the vaccine none of them actually were infected so it meant that loosely that the effectiveness was actually 100%. And the safety was also very, very clear that it was very safe for children between the age of 12 and 15. So vaccination as a strategy, it's going to be a very viable one. And in fact, uh, just last week on the 10th of May, the US FDA actually will announce and approve the use of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for children between the age of 12 and 15. So I think that's an important point because even though it's obliquely related to your question, David, on home-based learning, I'm, I'm trying to defer a little bit, let me ask. <laughs> but I think coming back to this home-based learning, as with any closures, and in this case, we're talking about school closures, really it is meant to buy time to figure out what is the situation. And the situation that I'm talking about here is the infection that children can get, perhaps with this variant B1617 variant that we're talking about, that children are now more susceptible, more likely to be infected with this variant. And they may perhaps even be passing this on amongst uh, to other children, whether it is in school buses or in the school. And I think the closures are meant 
for us to figure out this situation. And I've, I've always emphasized that throughout the pandemic, we are learning. I don't think that we have the answers, but we are looking at the data and moving along with it. But I should highlight that when it comes to home-based learning and school closures, it is not a long-term strategy. It is a strategy that actually increases inequity because there will be families that are much uh, more capable to cope with home-based learning, but many other families that will struggle massively with trying to make sure that their children are able to keep up with the work, with the curriculum. Not many parents are able to supervise their own children in terms of home-based learning. And I think this is why I would highlight that home-based learning is just a way for us to again tap the brakes, learn a little bit about the situation, break some of the chains of transmission that is happening in the schools, but it is not going to be a long-term strategy. So I do not think that it is going to be a strategy to achieve our long-term pandemic goals. In fact, I do see that the, re the announcement today around approving the vaccine for use of, for children between 12 and 15 is going to be one of the viable strategies in the long term. It's a bit of a two for one, isn't it, YY? Because it'll back straight onto the holidays. So you'll get, uh, for, 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 for one school closure, you'll get twice as much time. Yes. So the effective closures is actually eight days. But I think for some parents, they may think that the eight days is a very, very long time. Gentlemen, that's the questions I have. I'm going to uh, turn you over to Louisa, who has questions she's been uh, collecting from the audience members, and then I'll come back to you at the end. Louisa, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, professors. That was really excellent. And thank you to our audience as well for sending um, in really thought-provoking questions. There are almost close to 150 questions. We're not going to get through that, but I do believe that about, the good thing is about 90% of them have actually already been covered um, during the panelist discussion, which just tells us that Prof. David Allen is probably secretly reading all of your minds. <laughs> <laughs> but um, a lot of people have actually picked up um, on the CDC record recommendations uh, for demasking, uh, and that was also actually about 50% of our pre-submitted questions. So I'd just like to highlight that Professor Teo has actually given a very nice response as to why this is not likely to be suitable um, in the near future or even possibly beyond in Singapore setting. So some of the interesting questions that we haven't been uh, had haven't had a chance to cover so far. One of them is, will home-based testing be a likely strategy introduced into Singapore at any point? I, I think we are not going to be I hope we don't reach the stage where we issue our kids to households and ask them to test themselves. Uh, but I do see that this is an option for a more sustainable RRT uh, for healthcare workers, for instance, if you could do a swap at home or if you could collect saliva at home and send that in, that's certainly much better than queuing up in a line waiting to be swapped when it's your turn, right? And we can extend some of these to uh, the other groups of workers that need RRT as well. I would second that too. <laughs> and um, there was an interesting question that um, this is more than one audience member who has asked, is that now that we uh, have vaccinated individuals who are much less symptomatic or uh, even asymptomatic, how do we handle these uh, individuals uh, being a possible silent transmitter of um, the disease? And uh, I feel like there might be a simple math question in there somewhere, but I will leave it to the <laughs> experts to try and figure that out for us. I think this is the this is this transit that I was talking about before. Obviously, we'd be very keen to keep our numbers low by identifying all these people, but in, in a year or two, or whenever we 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 think is the time, or or maybe early next year, um, with, with a, a high number of the people vaccinated, then we will care less about cases and clusters because we know it's not translating into severe disease. So, so the vaccine turns this into a mild disease. This is the, the whole point. So the, the tricky part is the transition to where we really care about cases like six months ago to where we still quite care about cases like now to, to where in the future where we're not going to be monitoring every case and, and putting out daily sit reps and things like that. Perhaps just to add a little bit to what Dale has mentioned. And I think this is really why we keep highlighting, uh, not just we, but WHO has been highlighting throughout that while countries are rolling out their vaccination, they have to keep up with the rest of the public health measures. And it, it doesn't mean that the moment that you've been vaccinated, you can go about maskless and then you start to lift a lot of the social restrictions. Because the reality 
is that there will be other people who have not been vaccinated. And yet, at the same time, some of these vaccinated people could be infected, could be asymptomatic without realizing it, and going around spreading it to people who have yet to be vaccinated. So this transition that they'll talk about, it's a very important one, that as countries roll, roll out their vaccination, national vaccination plan, it takes time. And during this time, you have to keep up with your public health measures and trying to lift any restrictions at this point in time when your country has yet to reach a, a sufficiently high degree of, of vaccination uptake is actually going to be very dangerous. Thank you very much, Patio. Very well said. And I think that that is a message that actually we've also tried to highlight um, in all our webinar series so far. Yeah. So um, the next question actually is, I suppose um, this is a question that has you know, been asked by many of our Singapore residents who have been quite affected by the phase two heightened alerts, but still are thinking, why didn't we go into a full-blown circuit breaker to completely snuff out the cases rather than going through a little bit of a painful drag with allowing you know, some of the cases to still present themselves? Yeah, I, I, I'm anti-circuit breaker unless it's really necessary. Circuit breakers are good for health. If no one has any contact with anyone else and we all just stay home and things like that, then the disease stops. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a very um, nice, simple answer if you only care about health. But if you care about uh, social activities, weddings, births, funerals, um, birthdays, uh, catching up with granny every Sunday, if you care about those, if you care about the economy then we have to be smarter than just than just shutting everything down. So, so uh, yes, I, I'm pleased we, we haven't just gone to that extreme. I'm not ruling out that it'll be possible if, for instance, hospitalisation started going up. But, uh, but at this stage, no, I think we, we fight the good fight. So uh, one last question, I think, um, and this one maybe I'll just direct to Bosu. And uh, that is, why do we only have the mRNA vaccine so far in Singapore? And are there any thoughts of getting our so-called variety with the um, inactivated or um, the uh, adenovirus vector vaccines? So actually, I do believe that um, there are discussions to, to bring in more vaccines than the mRNA vaccines. And I think the, the main issue is the global supply issue. So I think as, as these vaccines become available, they will be brought into Singapore, assessed by HSA, and then made available. Are we allowed to ask uh, what goes into the consideration mainly? Because we heard a while ago that Sinovac might have been uh, a consideration, but so far there hasn't been follow-up on that. I'm sorry, I don't sit in the HSA committees. They've been very consistent. Quality, safety, efficacy. That's, that's all. This, it's a very simple process. So if you've got quality data, safety data, efficacy data, there it goes. So, yeah, that's, that's what's being asked of the different uh, people who submit. And David, can you comment on Sinovac? Quality, yeah. safety, and efficacy, Dale. <laughs> uh, lack of data still. Uh, it's been requested. Thank you so much, Louisa. That was wonderful. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and I'll, let me just quickly summarize. We've heard tonight that uh, vaccination is, is not the only answer, but it is in a very essential, uh, critical component to, to the solution. Um, measures that have been implemented are, are a bridge to longer term mitigation, such as uh, population immunity, preferably via vaccination. COVID-19 is not going to disappear. Uh, because we wish it to or because it's inconvenient and, or we're tired of it. We must confront it with our eyes open and adapt in an evidence-based proportionate manner. So it leads me to thank our, our panelists, uh, uh, Prof. Su, uh, Prof. Tio, and uh, uh, Prof. Dale, and Louisa for sharing their expertise uh, and time with us tonight. Uh, there won't be a pandemic video or pandemic song of the month. Uh, they'll return during our regularly scheduled uh, a webinar on the 27th of this month, which is in nine days time, where we'll talk about uh, things, uh, not just the items tonight. Uh, and until the 27th, uh, stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, socially distance, get vaccinated, and encourage everyone you know to get vaccinated. Thank you for watching and good night.